everyone Hi everybody how are you doing today i am online here on the discord server hello 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 so um uh, i think we can start there is a few people that are hello um uh, we got a few people in, and I think it's about to start. So, um, let's get into it. So, first of all, uh, let's go and talk and verify a little bit the what do you mean? What do we mean by the hidden time sync in HTTP client? Okay, a uh, little bit about me. You probably know me. I am co-founder and CTO of Platformatic, Matteo Collina, part of the Node.js Technica Steering Committee as well as a board member of the OpenJS Foundation, plus a bunch of other stuff. I have a newsletter at nodeline.dev, and you can follow me there. Cool. I also got to be to have something like 22 billion downloads per year, which seems a little bit uh, incredible. So, um, yay! It's pretty cool, right? The question that we are tackling today, and this is the most burning question, that you should, oh, you all should be asking all the time, mostly. What HTTP client should we use for Node.js? What do you think you should be using for Node.js? This is a question for uh, for all of you, and this is this is a question that I am I am asked so many times, literally, 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 literally so many times, doing every uh, every every week or something maybe. Somebody show up and says, oh, what HTTP client should we use? And they said, eh. I said, no, we use, mm. uh, okay, sorry about this. That happens. So anyway, now let's talk a little bit about popularity, okay? Let's take a look at the downloads in the past year, okay? These are, by my understanding, the most popular HTTP clients in, in the Node.js world in 2023, okay? Or up to now, for the last year. So, let's take a look. We have Axios, we have Got, we have NodeFetch, Request, and Undici. Okay, we can see a few interesting trends. Uh, first trend is Axios. You probably are familiar with all of those, right? Are you familiar with them? If you're not familiar with them, you should be familiar with them. Are you? So, that's, that's the gist. Um, should we do a, a, a popularity context for, for the frameworks? And should we choose about the framework, the... the, the the client. So looking at this, we can see that NodeFetch is actually gaining popularity, okay? And Axios, it's super popular still, okay? Uh, Undici is growing. In fact, you can see that it actually almost doubled and in terms of downloads numbers. And Request is slowly dying for whatever reason. Still a lot of very, very much use and got is pretty much the same. So, does it make any sense here? Um, well, should you use a library because it's most downloaded? Probably, but look, let's we will look at, at most of those at most of those libraries and we'll talk a little bit about them. So, let's talk about Axios. Axios is one of the oldest libraries, oldest HTTP clients for Node.js. It's been used everywhere, and um, it's promise based. And it was promise based when Node.js didn't have promises or something like that. Pretty cool, right? And uh, um, the best part of Axios, though, is that it is absolutely and completely um, isomorphic. And it works both on the client and on the server. It supports cancellation, it has interceptors, it supports posting files automatically, which is a significant pain. I don't know how many of you have done have, have, uh, have to upload files and do form call with files, but look, it's pretty bad. So... How do we do um, this? Well, yeah, it's a pretty cool library Axios, okay? I have seen quite a lot of people doing it, okay? Using Axios and doing this stuff. Um, another extremely popular library still, it's Request, okay? The old school Request module, still very much used, very much loved. A lot of projects have been using this extensively and they're still using it extensively. It's everywhere, more or less. Almost everybody has a dependency on this. Uh, but look, it's sorry, it's deprecated. Stop using this thing. It's 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 deprecated. 
How come it's deprecated? Okay, anyway, it's deprecated. There is a huge long issue, issue 3142. You can take a look at it, but look, you should not be using this. However, it's super much downloaded, okay? It is, it's super much downloaded. It's downloaded a huge amount of time per day. It's incredible. And why the, what the heck? It's, it's, it makes no sense, okay? But it's deprecated and not maintained anymore. So why would you risk a library for something like that? I have no clue, okay? There is also node fetch, okay? Which is also super popular, one of the most popular options, okay? However, uh, you know, node fetch in the latest years uh, have done um, something, something very, I don't know, um, odd, or I would probably, I call it odd. I have other opinions, more strong opinions, but I don't want to them to be on record. On record. Um, so node fetch, um, well, so node fetch is, uh, it's, it, so the, the problem with node fetch is it has fetch in the name, but it's not about it's not implementing the fetch specification as as uh, from the web from what UG streams. So um, to some extent, this is better because it allows you to be compatible with all the Node.js streams API and a lot of other things. But it's not isomorphic. Okay, you there is a very limited API surface that is the same. And you cannot expect the same behavior between the two. How can you use this? Um, why would you use this? Well, it's it's super popular. It's what it was. Fetch, Node.js did not have fetch for a long time. So, um, and this is what everybody uses. So, you know, this was fantastic. Thank you for building this. However, um, Node fetch is, is now ESM only. And very few people are upgrading. So there are 32 million downloads per week for V2, which is the common JS version, and only 3 million of the and 3 million of downloads per week for the ESM version. So the team has decided to uh, move to ESM, but the users did not. They stayed on common JS, and this creates a burden for maintenance and. Based on this, personally, either I use the SM version or I would not use this library. But this is my recommendation here. Okay. Nobody wants to stay behind with no path to update, right? So if you if you can use ESM, then yes, absolutely, go and use ESM. Otherwise, maybe not a great idea. So what I'm talking about and this talk and this work, this masterclass, is more or less all about Undici, which is an HTTP client for Node. And um, Undici was born a long time ago in one of my, my most uh, uh, prolific years. I, I don't remember if it's 2016, 2017, something like that. Maybe 2017, something. No, this came earlier. So this was definitely when Stranger Things... Can somebody know when Stranger Things were, went out? Stranger Things 1, 2015, more or less. I have a clue. Anyway, uh, I was uh, watching uh, the first... Um, season of Stranger Things and I was also on my sofa with a laptop and I thought and I was writing a, a benchmarking tool and I wrote the first version uh, at the time I was writing I, I, w I was writing my autocannon and autocannon is a load tester uh, a benchmarker written in node written in JavaScript and I thought well maybe I could apply the same logic to write an HTTP client not just a full a full-blown thing, a full uh, a load tester. And then Undici came out. And it's actually very neat to use, but it's a completely different stack, so we're going to talk a little bit about that soon. Uh, Undici is also what provides fetch for Node, okay? So if you use fetch from Node, you are uh, you provide fetch. It is what provides fetch for Node.js. Undici, what does it give you? It's faster, way faster. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second, okay? And um, it clearly it provides a complete split between various different responsibilities of an HTTP client. One is managing managing the connection, and one is managing the the API for the end users. So 
Uh, it's also maintained by the core team of Node.js, a uh, Node.js HTTP team. So basically, it's what all of us thinks uh, a modern HTTP client for Node should look like. It was uh, implemented from scratch uh, in the sense of there is no uh, uh, original HTTP, HTTPS modules in it. We'll talk a little bit more about that problem soon. And uh, um, it provides HTTP 1.1 pipelining support. Why Undici? Well, the problem is the Node.js, HTTP, and HTTPS module are an absolute mess. Like beyond anything that you could it, that you can phantom. Okay, uh, it uses the same base classes for both the client and the server, and this is problematic. Okay, because it also ties the connection pooling with the public API. So basically. There is the concept of the HTTP dot agent, and what dot agent do? It reuses socket. Okay, the, the what it provides are sockets. But wait a second, wait a minute. If I have an HTTP stream, an HTTP two stream, or even if I have a quick or the HTTP three system, how can I map it to that model? You can't. Simply put, you can't. So it's super problematic. And this means that you cannot support both HTTP 1 and HTTP 2 with the same API. Last but not least, and I'm sorry I'm shooting arrows at this all the time, it cannot be changed be without uh, breaking Express. Oh, why it breaks Express? The problem of Express is Express uses some of the internals of those base classes. So Express taps into, um, changes, the alters the prototype. Let me show you because it's people don't believe it. I think I showed in, in, in another masterclass or something. Okay, this is what it is. So when it, you do uh, anything in Express, it swaps the prototype of the request with something else, okay? And it does this all the time. And this means that when you call the request object that you use from Express, it's the node, the node one, but altered. And here you can see that it adds a lot of methods, it changes the behaviors of some stuff, and a lot of middlewares also change the behavior, which means it's actually um, pretty bad for, uh, for all the things. So going back here, uh, it does break Express. And well, it does make it express prevents uh, uh, the popularity of express and the fact that it monkey patches, it depends in alters some of the behavior of Node.js internals. It's uh, um, of, of the object creates a lot of problems. So take it, take it or leave it. It's problematic. Uh, why undici.request? Uh, we wanted undici.request aims to be as fast as possible by while providing, still providing a good, a good developer experience and uh, uh, also using Node.js streams. And we also wanted to support HTTP 1.1 pipelining, which me, it's something that we'll cover later in a second and something actually very important for performance. Um, we also use the same core uh, to provide undici.fetch, which is a um, almost spec compliant version of the fetch runtime. And it uses what, would you, what working group streams or web streams which means that the code using fetch could be isomorphic. And this is what I would recommend people to use. If you want your code to be isomorphic, you probably want to use undici fetch or fetch formula core, which is exactly the same thing. You can also have uh, HTTP2 support with it. I can, um, uh, we can talk a little bit more about that in the future. Uh, and uh, again, also the support HTTP 1.1 pipelining. So what now, what do you do with this? So how can we decide this? Okay, well, yes, uh, Undici is the same, uh, Undici fetch is the same thing that is built in on Node Core, plus there are a lot of things happening um, that it also other APIs that it provides, okay? This is the latest benchmark that I worked on this morning on those topics, okay? And this is essentially the, a, a, a full shutout of the uh, the benchmarks. And a lot of people, you probably have not seen this because it's the first time that I'm showing this every, anywhere. There's a PR open, but what it is, is it shows the, how Undici performs compared to all the other options in, in, the, in the node world, okay? 
note that you can have um, uh, Undici is fast. Okay, it's actually fast, really, really, really damn fast. And in fact, you can squeeze quite a lot of throughput out of it, and that you cannot squeeze out of the other uh, version. Note that the fetch version is actually not fast. Okay, Undici fetch is actually not fast, and then the one in Node is actually not fast. And uh, compared to other alternatives, so we I, we will also cover why it's not fast and what can we do and what are we doing as part of the Node team to help with that. So it is a little bit of an HTTP 1.1 pipelining explainer. So uh, this is the normal HTTP request, HTTP 1.1 request. Okay. Now you can see um, you can see here that you are you are uh, you have a, a sin. You have a client and a server, and we are opening our TCP request, which is what you're, we are doing to start. And then um, once the TCP socket, the TCP is open, we have a keep alive request. That's what it's called. And it means that we can keep the request alive and look at multiple things. So we send a request for a, a blob uh, of HTML or whatever your API call, and we get an HTML response uh, or your JSON or your API and it takes the server more or less like 40, 50, 20 milliseconds to respond. So the overall time is the time it takes for the round trip, which is called the RTT, round trip time, plus the server processing. So it's, it's, it's there. And once we get the, sec the second bit, we can send the second request. Okay. This is a typical flow of a browser. And uh, um, this is a typical flow of a browser and also of uh, 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 all HTTP client for Node. Um, based on the node core stuff, um, which it can be uh, uh, problematic because the socket is more or less sits idle all the time. Okay, so how does HTTP pipelining work? Well, pipelining is actually a great thing because it allows us to. It's kind of a bulk request, or you know, you send multiple. You can send multiple HTTP requests stacked on top of each other and the server will actually reply them in order. So you send, you ask for the two, your two API endpoints, and the server can do all the processing needs and get you the answer. So this means that you can actually create a lot of uh, respond way quicker uh, using the same socket and essentially shorten the uh, uh, use uh, essentially less sockets for the same things, but also keep the sockets way, way, way more utili utilized, which in turn expand the window of your um, your TCP windows. So uh, it, it's a great technique, especially if you want to limit the number of uh, available sockets going out socket for whatever region. And don't worry, they are always limited. Either you know it or you don't know it. So. What can happen though, and this is the problem, it's uh, the server responds in order. So if one of the two requests, uh, if, request, if, an, uh, if the first request takes longer to process than the second one, the second one will be queued. This is actually very critical for, for Node, okay? For, for, uh, for, for HTTP pipelining, it means that uh, a response can be delayed. So good, bad, yay, you need to know. This is the probably reason. This is the reason why browsers don't use them for their rendering pipeline. Okay, because you don't, they can't predict. Okay, but you know, for our systems in in for doing API calls, it's not bad because we can actually reuse the sockets and use a lot of those same sockets. Okay, and it actually provides a better response and better response times than. Uh, the other, because most of the time when we call an API endpoint, they are more or less the same response time, more or less. So, okay. So let's take a look inside Undici because that's the cool part. Undici provides the foundation for what we call HTTP next on node. And it's, it has a, a clear separation. It offers a clear separation between the HTTP, between the, the API that developer uses and the underlying systems that provide those APIs. And in fact, it uses its own system. It doesn't, it doesn't use it neither called errorbacks or events to provide the internals. 
It also manually manages inside it connection pools and all things like that, which is actually fundamental to provide the performance and minimizes the transition between uh, C++ and JavaScript. Also very, very important. How is it built? Well, Undici is built on the concept. There is a higher level APIs. This is what you can see and use, like, for example, fetch or request. And then internally, we have uh, uh, the concept of a dispatcher, and which is a generic theme. And you can have an agent, which is a type of dispatcher, but there can have, can, you can have a lot of type of dispatchers that are uh, not even agents, essentially. How does it work? Well, you, you configure your agent. You can configure the keep alive. You can configure how much pipeline you want. You can configure how many sockets you want to open for a given destination. Note that all of these setups are fundamental for a production system. Like if you are not configuring all of this in a production system, you are uh, going to put yourself in trouble because those things need to be configured, essentially. Um, otherwise, you will be... Uh, even with Node Core, you need to configure this. You have set the HTTP, the global agent in Node Core all the time. Because if you don't, you will end, have problems with production systems, essentially. The way Undich works, there is a global agent that is set, it's stored inside the global software process, and then it's reused. It also also the same with fetch, essentially. You can use the same global agent for fetch too. It's great. Then the question comes, what are the dispatchers and how are, have we got the dispatcher going? So this is the dispatcher hierarchy, okay? And we have a dispatcher, which is a ab completely abstract concept, which has also a dispatcher based, which actually adds a lot of method to it that are actually needed for most dispatchers, but not all. Okay, funny. And there are, I can show you who inherited from this and who inherited from dispatcher and dispatcher base. So it's probably get, getting yourself a little bit clearer. And from there, we have the client, the client at the, at the, on the left, it's a um, core bit that wraps a single socket. So you have the client wrap a socket, okay? Then on top of it, you have, a, you can have a pool, okay? And the pools uh, represent a bunch of sockets, okay? And we have a pool or a balanced pool. The balanced pool is actually pretty neat, a pretty neat concept, okay? That will probably need to work a little bit more on the core of Fundici, but it allows you to do load balancing between multiple peers at the level of your HTTP client, which is pretty cool if you can have that information. So if you don't have anybody else doing the load balancing, you can do the load balancing within your app. Then we have the agent, which is essentially uses a bunch of pool and create a pool for each origin that you are calling. The origin is the domain name uh, plus the host, the, the port. And because it has this rich system, you can even create a mock agent, okay? And the mock agent, you can configure as the global dispatcher, and then you can use that to, and then that will intercept the request locally and send them over. Pretty amazing, right? I, I, it's, it's, it has embedded mocking, essentially. You will probably have used knock or something like that for this in, in the past. What is a dispatcher? Okay, a dispatcher provide a dispatch method. Okay, very funnily. Uh, the dispatch method offer, uh, uh, it has the options, which is what the user pass in, and it offers the handlers. It is passing an handler. The handler is just a class, okay, but it's mostly an internal concept. But it, this is the low level system, it's the low level interface that we use to build all the other APIs. So if you have request, we'll create a request handler internally, okay? Stream, fetch, pipeline, all of them, they will have their own handler to, to, to implement. What does an handler look like? Well, this is how a dispatch handler look like. It's not hard, but it's a lot of things. So we have a non-connect callback. It's an object that implements this interface. It has an on-connect callback. It has an on-error callback when there is an error, okay? Um, we have an on-upgrade because if there is an upgrade thing coming, yeah. And then we have, for example, on headers. On headers is called when there is an header, can be called multiple times in case of one XX uh, status code. And we have one for receiving data, okay, essentially. And then we have uh, complete and on body send and so on and so forth. Cool. So this is uh, pretty neat from my point of view, okay? 
it's one of the greatest bits of tech that um, uh, it is one of the greatest interface that we could think about because this powers why it's so fast because we ditch a lot of the uh, traditional control flow and we go one level down and because we went one level down we could actually be very fast and be faster significantly faster than all the others so to the point that uh, uh, this system is so flexible that, for example, you could get a retry agent and create an agent that you know can retry things if they go south. And a retry agent, in fact, is just an agent that internally uses a, re a, a, a retry handler. Uh, let's unpack this. So we take a retry agents, we just inherit from dispatcher, and dispatcher is just a base class that has a few closed methods by default which essentially just wraps things very quickly, okay? It's pretty cool because you can, uh, it just wrap things. So these, um, so you have your, we have our agent, we store our agent. There's a good question in the chat. So by design of Fundish, it's expected to compose agents by wrapping them together to extend the logic. Generically, yes, there is another extension method that we have right now that you can use. Instead, okay, it depends on where you want to fit in and how do you want to extend your code, essentially. For the retry, you will need to do this, okay? Um, there are other, slightly other ways to wrap and or orchestrate your things in a slightly different way. I'll show them in a moment. There is also the concept of interceptors, which is actually very cool because you just got the question asked and this is the answer. So we have the concept of inter interceptors. And an interceptor is um, essentially uh, an option. You can pass some options to, to an agent. So you can say, oh, I have uh, here, I have a dispatcher, I have an agent, I create a new agent, and then I say, I want to these interceptors and apply it, and there is the pool, okay? And I have this create OIDC interceptor here, which it's a library, Undicho IDC interceptor is a library that we have created that allows you to essentially add uh, the uh, authorization, better token, metadata um, without you having to do anything, okay? It just happens underneath the cover. Works great. It's a great pattern. So a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot less work. So this is great. So there's another interesting question that is, it's also possible to have a local dispatcher or dispatcher used only for certain endpoints. Yes, absolutely, okay? You can... You know, you can even pass the dispatch, like if you here, you can see that this works with the global dispatcher, but in in here, in this example, I'm just creating one and this is just for one thing, okay? So you could create uh, one for a specific endpoint or a specific service if you want to, or you can use the same one with different config for each one of your systems. It's, very fl it's super flexible underneath. Okay, but the API stays the same on top because it's all based on this concept of the handlers. So it's um, actually, it's a very, very interesting interface. So going back here, this is how it works. Okay, I, I, I like it. Uh, I like this system quite a lot because I don't need to think about um, getting a token, ratioing a token. I don't know many, how much time have you lost doing this kind of dance when interacting with the IDC based systems, I, I, I had a long time. And also other people in our team had that for a long time. We wrote this code, I don't know so many times, that I, in the end we decided, well, let's just wrap all of these up and just put into a library. So let me show you very briefly how it works. Okay, here we go. So this is the terminal. Okay, so uh, let's go in. Undici. Oh, yeah, it was the old name. Clear. Okay. Yeah, so well, let's go inside examples. Ooh. Yeah, let's do the commit because so you can access them. Yay. Fantastic. Okay. Should I also issue a release? No, I'm not doing that. Maybe, maybe, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, now it's correct. Okay, so um, let's let's take a look at the servers, at the, at the modules. So here we have, this is our, 
our identity provider. So this provides, it's a server, it's a YDC compatible identity provider. Um, there is a lot of config here. I'm not going to specify much more. Uh, the key important bit is it has a client TD, client secrets. So uh, it will work with that, but the agent can also work with refresh tokens if you pass it to them. So we can we can start. So we have this. Then we can uh, we, there is the server, and the server doesn't. If there is an authorization, it just do that. Otherwise, it verifies it. It's pretty good. That's what it does, and it also does the JWKS dance, so that we we call the uh, JWKS server to revalidate the system. Cool. We discover the JWKS essentially. And finally, there is the client, which is exactly what you what you show, what you saw in the uh, in the slide. Which it's uh, um, we create an interceptor for for a pool. Okay. Cool. So, how does it work? Well, let's run it. So we can do node IDP. Ooh. Sorry, it's running. I have it running already. Okay, just a second. Let me kill them. Okay, here we go. So now it's open. Yeah. And then we can do node the server. Actually, I'm starting node server here and node IDP here. Good. Then I can do as I issue my client. So I can do node client node client and now you can see it worked but look look at it it actually issued the token and it did all the dance it's fantastic we were able to issue all the dance it's pretty neat how it's implemented because you might wonder oh this is a lot of code okay now the beauty of fundici of fundici is it's actually not a lot of code like this is actually 144 lines or something okay and it um, is actually just based on creating an, ID, uh, um, um, an interceptor and uh, using the uh, retry handler, which is the same thing that the retry agent uses internally, and just wrapping that. That's as, as easy as it can get, okay? And it's not a lot of code. So you can try it, you can work with it, it's, it's pretty good. However, I think Interceptor are getting removed in one of the next releases of major releases of Fundici. So um, we, what will be replaced upon? I'm still not sure. Otherwise, I will talk about it. And I'm pretty sure that we will definitely talk a little bit about that in the future. So, yay. Now, you would wonder why is Fetch slow, okay? Compared to Request, Fetch is damn slow. Well, I've created a little bit of a small repo to show it, so... Fetch a flame, okay. This is a, a clinic JS flame graph that shows the flame graph of that script that you just saw. I didn't run it, okay. We could, but it's, it doesn't matter. Now, what we can see on the left here, you can see this in the readable stream. You can see that this has been growing a lot, okay? Spending a lot of time inside the readable stream. It's also spending a lot of time inside the transform stream, okay? In fetch, in creating it. And in the internally inside the, again, the transfer stream. Even this set up readable stream default controller from source. It's a long method, and this takes a lot, of, a lot of time. Okay. Now this tool is actually pretty cool, so you could even add a lot of the V8 stuff if you want. But the TLDR here is, it's actually using a lot of um, resources just to create those streams. So. How? Why? Why do you do that? We do that. Well, it's a spec. So what can we do here? I don't know, but the TLDR is fetch is low. If you want speed, probably want to use undici.request. 
And this is the explanation of the diagram. Okay. You can even use the dispatcher pattern to make magic, okay? And do, do let uh, the HTTP system do something that it's not supposed to be used for, or maybe uh, uh, make some changes to it. So um, HTTP is the best standard interface, okay? There is a, a, a very nice uh, RFC, RFC 9, 19, 1910, which splits the semantics and out of the wiring protocol in its, own, in, in its own RFCs. So, and all of the three uh, version of HTTP relies on the same semantics. This means that you can have an HTTP, HTTP based semantics without having, a, without having a different, with different uh, wiring protocol, which is pretty cool. So, and you can even implement the same semantic in, in process, so without having to do anything. So, in fact, we can even use uh, Undici Dispatcher to implement networkless HTTP. Haha, <laughs> you know? So how do you do, how do you inject an HTTP request in a node server? Well, you know, if we want to do that, we need a library. It's called um, Light My Request. Like my request allow us to in inject, to emulate uh, what HTTP.createServer does. And you just need to pass in a function. This is also part of Fastify because, you know, I, look, I created this thing. So, and it's growing steadily. In fact, I think it's probably higher than 6 million. Oh, not this graph, um, but uh, this, which is also growing a lot. Um, Fastify, okay. And Fastify has been growing uh, a lot lately. Too. and in it went 6.6 .6 in January so and now it's still a third of the month and we're still missing it's still, still up 4.5 pretty good fastify is great and you can it actually has a uh, light my request embedded so you have app.inject to run this is the undici dispatch how fastify undici dispatcher works underneath so you get your agent okay system and you can just, you know, route a local domain to Fastify server. That's it. That's what it does. Okay. And then you can, it works for uh, request, fetch, pipeline streams, you name that. Same API everywhere. Super great. How do you use all of that in Platformatic? Okay. And well, um, to be clear, Platformatic is a system to help you with your backend uh, development work and put it on autopilot. Oh, by the way, before we do that, you should be using Undici, okay? It's, I tried to explain why Undici was so much better, and uh, the answer probably of why you should be using Undici is, is here. If you have just joined, uh, you should be using Undici. There's no excuse to uh, not do that, okay? Platformatic, um, we help you build uh, your backend systems, okay? And typically, we you all spend a lot of time in building a, a, a backend system and doing concerns that are not critical for your app. You do uh, updates, API clients, local development, monitoring docs, logs, a lot of things. Okay, but all of those mostly are not feature use, useful for your employer or business. So um, why you do that? Well, because they are needed. But what if you could actually use a library that does it for does it for them? What Platformatic does, it allows you to move very quickly from A to C, okay? And then you can, like if you were on a high-speed train, okay? And then move to uh, C to B as easy, okay? But, you know, this is your custom part. So instead of having using some Rails-based systems or some something that is very, very uh, much uh, uh, bound, you do, um, we, have, we allow full customization. So how does it work? Well, we have created a lot of, a lot of tools and then we can see if, how they work, okay? So you, we have um, uh, the Platformatic Service, Platformatic DB, Platformatic Client, which is what we're talking about in this session we have big uh platformatic runtime uh, the breaking change detector the composer a lot of things here that are very powerful let's go through them so the first one i want to talk about is platformatic service is the one of the nicest components because it's essentially fastify on steroids it has a lot add a lot of behavior on top of fastify 
that you probably need or you're probably going to do implement it yourself anyway. So just do it. Okay, just you can use this where you use Platformatic service and it will just work. Okay. There is also Platformatic DB, which provides uh, um, this is the first thing that we released actually. And we as corporated Platformatic service from it. Platformatic DB allows a one to a one to one mapping with between your uh, relational database tables to your uh, APIs. Pretty neat. And then we do migrations. You can do migrations and so on and so forth. And the composer can actually, you know, compose multiple systems together. And last but not least, what we are going to talk about is Platformatic Client, which is something that I, I personally love. And you will need to, it allows you to create uh, an API for your system in very more or less no time using OpenAPI or GraphQL, and uh, that's it. You can either create a local library or a library that will run on the browser. The local library is for servers and is slightly different than the one for the browser because um, different needs, okay? And I have a talk that will be included in the reference that describes the, 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 uh, how uh, all of those are implemented, but we are just going to use them right now. And last but not least, Platformatic Runtime allows you to run multiple microservices within the same node systems and or separate node systems, okay? And everything is routed together by Undici and the um, the technique that we have sh we have just shown. Okay, so let's try to see if we can get some some demo going for this. Okay, so we are here. So what we can do is we can run, for example, create Platformatic and PX create Platformatic and we create an application and we can run it, call it uh, P1. First, we create a database because we want to, let's call it uh, DB. And you're going to use uh, MySQL, yeah. And we add another one called service and uh, let's call it service. Yes, and we want a composer. Let's call it composer. You want to create another one? No. What is the top level? It's going to be composer. And no, we are not using task right now, but you definitely could. No. First things, it will install all the dependencies and then it will do a few minutes, a little bit more things. In the meanwhile, if you have questions about this or anything that I showed you before, please let me know. Can we combine different composer? Probably yes. I have not tried it, but I think so. The composer is open API based, so yes, I think you could. But would I do it? Probably not. Okay, P1. Let's take a look at what was generated. We have the DB service and composer. Okay, cool. So we could do npm start. Okay, it has generated stuff, added types, and so on and so forth. Great. So it is the system. We can go open uh, uh, open API, and we have our movies, which is our default database. So, for example, we could create a movie, and this is required. So let's add a movie. Let's call it uh, Star Wars. Okay. And yay, we have got 27 milliseconds. Then we can get the movies and we get Star Wars. Note that we have a few uh, system, a few things that we could add. And then we could even add more. There's more. There's a lot, lot, a lot more. Okay. So we could even um, add, uh, set it the total count to true, for example and send the request and now you see that you got a header called x total count and it's one hey does work okay now you we also have these other endpoints that were created pretty neat and easy nothing that you would not expect from this it's actually fantastic you like it 
I think so. I think it's pretty cool. What can we do with this? Okay. Uh, well, we can grab our uh, 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 the Open API spec, the link to the Open API spec. Okay. So you can, for example, do curl. Oh. Nope. Hey, nice. Okay, I can download it. And I can do also do this, JSON. Okay, this is my open API spec. So I could take this and last this out. This is what we would expect it to be. Okay. Now imagine that you want to, to talk to you are writing a front end a front end client, uh, a web API or whatever. So um Let's call it W1, CDW1, okay, npm init dash y, whatever. Now, what you could do is platformatic client here, platformatic client, and then pass in dash dash browser. Oh, wrong thing. Front end, not browser, front end. Okay. Let's take a look what was generated from us. It's an MJS file, uh, ESM, because we like ESM, that provide you quite a little bit of modules. So let's let's just try this out. So uh, what we can do is uh, nvim client nvim package.json. Um, let's do type module. Um, okay. So we could implement, for example, get movies from API, api.mjs. So now we have get movies. You see that we have get movies from, but we need to set something. For them, we can need to set the base URL and now const res await get movies. Let's try this client. Ooh, what did I? Ah, Michael Jackson script. Um, ha. Huh. Let's take a look. Ah, is DB get movies? Sorry about this. Because in fact, this was for our DB. So it's DB get movies. Okay. And I need to pass in an object. Here we go. TypeSkit would have caught that. Ouch, found a bug. Cool. And I think it's because it's the wrong server. It's not. Here we go. 3042. Here we go. Yes. Okay. So console log res. Okay. Wrong server that's running on my system. We get Star Wars. So you see that we can get our client and we can reuse our clients for all of it. And we also have all the endpoints. By the way, as you can see, these have no dependency whatsoever. Like it has no dependencies and it is only 253 lines of code because it actually splits the, the JavaScript with the types. So we have the types and then we uh, just use reuse those types in the code. So um, this allows us to be more relatively contained in terms of coding size. So, however, I typically don't like this and I actually prefer to use the builder pattern so I prefer to say build and do this, okay? Which will also work. Which is, I think, pretty cool because it allows it allows you to um, set up things and avoid a lot of problems with when building clients. This is very interesting. Oh, sorry, I stopped it with I shouldn't have. Cool, okay. Pretty neat. Um, 
Now, however, the client, this is the front-end client, and we can use the client, that fetch-based client everywhere. It just works. It's based on fetch, which is in turn based on Undici. So you can even use the Undici system to do all the things that we talked about uh, in Node. In the browser, well, you are in the browser. It works on from Electron to Vite, React, View, Angular, whatever you want to use it, it just works out. However, we can go back inside our code and go inside P1, okay? It comes with zero configuration undici. Yes, Node Core has zero configuration undici built in. So it's slightly faster than Node Fetch without having to worry about config details. It's pre made, pre baked in for you. Yeah. Now, what you can also do, you have created three services here. You have Composer, DB, and Service. Let's say that we want to um, that we want to call DB from Service to provide an end, a new endpoint. For example, to make all the titles uppercase. So what you can do is you go inside Services, you go inside the, cart the cart folder of your service. Now you can do Platformatic Client dash dash runtime because this is a platformatic runtime and we want to call it uh, db and the name of it dash dash name is going to be movies yay okay created a bunch of stuff if we refresh your folder we now have a movies folder we can see that this is just has nothing in it it contains only a link to the types because that's the only part that you need so these provide the types for your module because in the platformatic world we everything is already configured inside your system telling you what type of things you have and the name of the service. Note that it includes the the, the link to sorry the full path of the open API so that you don't need to re, so that we can we don't need to rely on the servers being available. So here in your routes, you can you can just you just need to load movies. Here. And once you have loaded it, we can, for example, add another endpoint. Let's call them titles. Okay, and then here we just do map to get the title. This is taken, restarted. So now if I refresh, go back into my API reference, now you can see that I have the service title, titles here that I can take and send my request to. Now it's failing because we have not filled in the, uh, uh, well, because we got a mistake because the, the client is called get movies. So let's try again. No, how it's called. It's at movies, okay. Performatic JSON. Where did I do? Did I do something wrong? Here we go. Reading at movies. I call it movies, name movies. Should be good. Bang. Let's go in here. Let's restart it. Oh yeah, of course. It's not in request in Fastify. It's inside the request. This is actually very critical. The client is attached to the request. It's not attached to the server. Why you might ask? Because it's attached because we want to move forward certain security headers. So you can actually configure platformatic client to automatically um, convert those. Okay. So and now this works, and you can see here we have Star Wars. Um, set correctly. 
okay? For example, you could um, use, and you can see it in the types, okay? There is uh, configure movies, okay? And you can pass a, a, a configure movies options, which is um, essentially, it, yeah, which it's a, um, it provides a get headers function, which is essentially how to extract the headers that you want to move through. Um, this is very useful, for example, for security concerns and a lot of other stuff. Okay, now the funny part of all of this is that if we want to have the same client, which is Undici base, this is based on Undici dot request, by the way. Okay, so if I want it to go inside here, okay, I could even generate it with. Uh, Plt client and I need to take my full JSON. So instead of doing that, I can just pass in the full JSON and call it composer. Ah yes, call client, sorry. Now I can go inside client. Okay, and now you can see here that I have very different stuff. I also have a, a CJS file that allow us to, this is a platform, um, a Fastify plugin that you can use, but truth to be told, you don't need it, okay? Most of the time you actually don't, um, you might not need it, you can just use the PLT client uh, uh, module and this will give you a full-blown, um, the full-blown system. Now, you still need the types and the types are very important part of the experience, so it's fully typed, but for the types we need to auto-generate. But the actual client is assembled from the path of your uh, Open API. A few interesting, more interesting bits. If we go inside reference, client, there is even a build Open API client function that you can do. So you can even, and this is based on HTTP.request. So let's let's try that. Okay, we don't need anything here. We just need so make here. Okay, so let's do npm i platformatic client. Here we go. Okay, and then we can do. We can copy this out. So and vim him. Let's pass it. And here I can just pass in my my HTTP. So I could just do forty two documentation dot JSON just JSON. Cool. No headers. No nothing. And here I could just do db get movies. This is what will be generated. And here do a rest. Let's try this. Ooh. HTTPS from version number. Hey. Ooh. Documentation. JSON. Here we go. And it works exactly as before. We have not specified absolutely anything. And we can actually create a client just by uh, pointing it to the system. Or you can pass in path for a local file. So essentially, you can have an, uh, um, uh, an API client for your system with absolutely nothing. And you can even have use the types that, we, that are auto-generated for it. So it's pretty cool, um, I would say. And there are a lot of options here that you can use. There is also GraphQL. We probably have to, we probably integrate GraphQL things a little bit more. Now, the important part of all of this is that writing the client, like everybody spends a lot of time uh, writing uh, uh, all the clients uh, for their microservice system. And if you don't spend, it's time that is completely wasted. Okay, it's a waste. Okay. And we have um, uh, we have found it in all our systems 
um, very easily uh, when building our, 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 our product. And we have decided, well, we need to do something about it. And we started working on the client. And that was a fantastic idea on the product. And sooner rather than later, this became one of the major features of Platformatic because it saves so much time. Like, you should not be spending time in, 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 in writing custom clients. It's just a lot of work. It's code that you need to maintain, keep up to date, and so on and so forth. Yeah, just works out of the box, okay? And it's type safe, and so on and so forth. So, I don't know. Check it out. And I am uh, open for question and more or less on time, which is probably the first time that this thing is on time. Do you know when Node.js will have the fetch without the experimental fetch flag? Right now, there is not the flag anymore. We are probably using an outdated version of Node. So, my client, my fetch, JS, await, fetch, 3042, um, DB, movies, Oh, made a mistake. It's my fetch put in the wrong address, maybe. Let's see, in the composer. Because I, oh, it's movies. This is DB movies. Oh, I need to put a slash at the end, I think. Here we go. Yay, it's, there's no experimental fetch. So if you have a question about experimental fetch, you probably should update it. I don't know, NVM use 16. If I did use 16, um, this is not there. And you're probably, and then I needed to do experimental fetch to have it, yeah. But uh, be careful, folks, because Node 16 is not supported anymore. It's out of LTS, so you should be using 18 or 20. So there is a question about Undich specifically. In the case I have a service which might invoke an external API thousand times, what dispatcher would it be better for the use case? What would the default zero config is enough? Use a pool. No, the pool is used by default internally, but if you need to call an endpoint a lot, you should probably want to customize something in your app, okay? You will need to, uh, to configure it, I think. It's... Uh, Almost impossible that if you eat a lot, you will get it. I would use undici.request, not fetch, because a request is significantly faster and it has significantly less over it, okay? And uh, you would need to, um, to configure it. Yeah, I would not. If you are doing a heavy load HTTP, you should probably configure it uh, manually. There's unlikely you will get extremely good, uh, the best performance. The defaults are pretty solid and pretty good, okay? But you will want to configure it, especially for one specific thing, okay? And let me show you, let me explain you why, okay? So in the setting of Undici, now this is, a, we have a website. We are probably open going to open a Google Summer of Code for Undici to rewrite the docs because the docs are not great, okay? Sorry about this, folks. Um, so... However, if we go into the client, okay, which it's actually, uh, actually, no, I need the pool. Um, okay, contrary to what you can imagine, the most important settings is this connections number. You want to limit the number of total connection you are using to talk to your external endpoint. This is fundamental for having good perf because if you keep it unlimited, okay, it, when you need one more connection, it will try to get one. However, it, you might queue it forever because the number of connections that your pod can make or your process or your VM can make is limited by the number of sockets that the operating system can allocate for you. So if you're doing a lot of calls to an external HTTP server, you want to limit the number of connections that you can make. 
then you need to specify, uh, then with that, you can limit the connections so that the queue, instead of happening at the operating system level when a socket is available, it happens inside your process and that will be fantastic. On top of that, you need to use pipelining. So you can set HTTP pipelining and this allows concurrent requests to be sent over the same TCP and TL or TCP TLS connection. And uh, um, if you're not doing, if the server is not doing long running, um, uh, long running requests that takes a lot of time, pipelining is fantastic. Okay, it's really really fantastic. Okay, so you should be using pipelining for calling your server in this way you will be using your 50 sockets or 100 sockets, whatever you are calling, at the best possible way, and send, start sending requests over for the server to process while you are waiting for, enough, for other responses, which I think is fantastic. Cool. I don't think there are any other questions, so I think uh, I, it's time for goodbyes. Thank you very much for, uh, for watching, and let us know about uh, uh, what you think. And there is a comment box in maybe there is more questions coming. Um, there is a feedback box that you can also you can also receive in your um, in your inbox. Um, it's great. Um, yeah, thank you very much and bye 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 bye.